Picture someone solving a crossword puzzle. Where are they? Are they using a pen or a pencil? How old are they? What are they wearing on their head? This may seem like a weird question, but I promise I have a reason for asking it. Take a look at the way these two common head coverings, cap and do-rag, have been clued in the New York Times crossword, starting with cap. Bit of attire sometimes worn backward, stadium souvenir, part of a baseball uniform. These clues may be unsurprising if you're familiar with the crossword and its historic emphasis on things like golf or World War I battle sites or baseball. Now take a look at how do-rag has been clued over the years. Hip hopper's headgear, rapper's headwear, kinda cringy, right? It gets a little bit better in more recent years, close fitting head covering, hair pattern protector, but here's the thing. Anyone who has ever worn a do-rag spells it D-U-R-A-G, and how many times has it appeared in the crossword? Once, you're looking at it. And so why does this matter? This matters because the people who create the puzzle shape its content. And it matters because representation matters. <laughs> because seeing yourself, your culture, your family, your history, your head coverings reflected back to you in a cultural institution like the crossword puzzle, that matters. <laughs> uh, and so, because of this, crossword puzzles have become the site of an ongoing cu cultural reckoning. Here are just four headlines that came out in the popular press over the last few years about systemic bias and racism in the crossword, both in what's contained in the contents of the puzzle and who creates the puzzle. Two of these articles are quoted here. First, co crossword constructor Natan Last wrote in The Atlantic in 2020 that the crossword mainstays are largely written, edited, fact-checked, test solved by older white men. And so they get to decide what fits into that 15 by 15 grid and what's kept out. A year later, in the Washington Post, another article discussed the idea of common knowledge in the crossword, and how common knowledge in the crossword, again, is largely decided based on this idea of the average or normal constructor being a white man, probably in his 50s. Here's some data from three of the major daily puzzles just about the people who get included in the crossword. On the left, you have data on the number of women who are included in the crossword relative to people included. In the Wall Street Journal in 2020, only 31% 20, well, only of the people in the puzzle were women, despite women making up more than half the population. And people from minoritized racial groups were only 24% of the people included in the puzzle, despite the fact that people from minoritized racial groups make up more than 40% of the population. And so, this is also true, as you can see, in these other major daily puzzles. If you are a constructor of crosswords, the editors tend to assume that you are also white and male. And the data bears that out. I know this is a little bit hard to see, but in red, you can see the percent of constructors who made the New York Times crossword puzzle each year who were women. Orange on this bar chart <laughs> represents teams that included men and women. And in blue, you can see puzzles that were just made by men. In the year 2021, of the 365 puzzles that the New York Times put out, only 100 were made by women or teams that included women. The vast majority of puzzles were made by men working alone. And if you do a deeper dive into just the last two years, you can see that more women are making their first appearance in the puzzle than ever before, and that's awesome. But a gender disparity persists. And if you do a closer look at just the Thursday and Saturday puzzles, which are the trickiest ones of the week, this disparity is even starker. And of course, there's no public data on the race and ethnicity of crossword constructors. But in general, there's a pretty strong amount of evidence that there aren't very many black constructors out there who are getting published in major publications. <laughs> One black constructor wrote in the Washington Post this year, I'm a black woman who creates crossword puzzles. That's rare, but it shouldn't be. And in a Washington Post article, Crossword constructor Cameron Austin Collins wrote about the New York Times Black History Week in which they published all black constructors for seven days that people already knew who the Friday and Saturday constructors would be. They knew that when Eric Agard had the Friday, Cameron Austin Collins was going to be on Saturday because there just aren't that many black people publishing crosswords in the Times. So you may be asking yourself, what does this have to do with medicine? And that's fair, but I promise I have a connection here. 
My argument is that, like the idea of the average solver in crosswords, the idea of the average patient in medicine is equally limiting and problematic. Take, for example, the idea that there is an average heart attack patient. In general, women have worse outcomes when they experience heart attacks than men, in part because healthcare professionals don't always recognize heart attack symptoms in women. A couple years ago with a colleague, we wrote a paper taking a look at an online simulation training meant for medical students to learn how to manage a heart attack. We noticed that of the nine patients in the simulation created by the American Heart Association, not a single one was a woman. And so it should be unsurprising if, if trainings like those created by the American Heart Association describe symptoms in women as atypical or abnormal, then the idea that the average heart attack patient is a man pervades and that people are less likely to recognize these symptoms in women. Similarly, women are less likely to receive CPR, both from bystanders and from medical professionals. There's research that demonstrates that, in part, this is because most people are trained to perform CPR on masculine bodied mannequins, like the one you see here on the left. Um, other research shows that people are uncomfortable performing CPR on women because they've never practiced performing CPR on a person with breasts. At my own institution, we have a state-of-the-art simulation center, but the only mannequin that has breasts is the one you see here on the right. That's Sim Mom. She's not used for training CPR. She's used for training how to deliver babies. And so again, it should be unsurprising that women have less likely, are less likely to experience CPR when they, have, when they need it because people are not trained to perform it on people with breasts. Another pitfall of the idea of the average patient is apparent in this image from the New England Journal of Medicine. Most people are familiar with the bullseye marking that indicates that someone may have been exposed to Lyme disease. However, that bullseye marking is much harder to discern on darker skin and sometimes doesn't appear at all. So if we are teaching our students that the typical or normal presentation of Lyme disease looks like it does on white skin, that's bad for patients who have darker skin who may not get their diagnosis. And it's bad for the students who are learning this material who may feel othered by hearing the presentation on their skin is abnormal. Okay, so how do we fix it? I argue that we need three things. First, better leadership. Second, better tools. And third, better support for diversity in all its forms starting at the top with better leadership. In crossword puzzles, what this looks like uh, is editors making a conscious choice to include more women and people from historically excluded backgrounds. Here we have the data for two other major daily puzzles that are doing a much better job of making their puzzles reflect the population that solves them. Uh, the Universal and the USA Today editors have made this choice and have spoken publicly about their decision to emphasize people from excluded backgrounds. It would be easy for the other editors to make this same choice, and we could have puzzles across the board that reflect the population of solvers. That's leadership. In medicine, what this looks like is leaders deciding to make a commitment to diversity, equity, inclusion, and above all, justice. Here at my own institution, a colleague of mine who is a leader at our university created a checklist that educators can use to evaluate their own materials for instances of bias and stereotypes and problematic references to the average or normal patient. My institution has decided that this is so important that it's now mandatory for all medical faculty to use this checklist on their own materials. That's leadership too, but it's not enough either. One other thing we need are more and better tools like that checklist. In crosswords, the most important tool that you have is your word list. This is a list of words that works with your construction software, and it recommends letters, it recommends words based on letter patterns in your grid. For years, the only publicly available word list was created by one man, and it reflected his view of who or what was worthy of inclusion in a crossword. Recognizing the limitations of just one word list, recently several more constructors have created publicly available, freely available word lists that emphasize people from historically excluded backgrounds like women and people of color, 
uh, in order to allow constructors who share those backgrounds to create puzzles that look like them. In medicine, better tools look like better mannequins and simulation tools that resemble the population that we're meant to serve. Sometimes they can be a little bit eerie <laughs> in how lifelike they get, but I would argue that this is better than the white male mannequin monopoly we've been experiencing to date. This is an image of a mannequin that my institution has recently acquired and will, which will be joining Sim Mom as another mannequin with breasts for our students to use in training. In medicine, another important thing, like with crosswords, are the words that we use when we talk about our patients and the injustices that they face. The AAMC has recently released a guide to language that will help us talk about our patients and their struggles with language that is focused on equity. Take, for example, disadvantaged or underserved, which are words we hear a lot when talking about patients from historically excluded groups. Now, disadvantaged is not technically wrong, but it leaves out the fact that those disadvantages didn't happen in a vacuum, but resulted from historical and intentional exclusion and disinvestment. So the words that we use shape the conversation and the narrative around who or what is considered average and who is other. Finally, I argue that we need better support for diversity, both in crosswords and in medicine. And this doesn't just mean admitting more students from historically excluded backgrounds or soliciting more crossword puzzles from women. It's going to involve creating safety and institutional supports for those people within the institutions that have historically excluded them. In crosswords, one way that we can do this is through the creation of venues that specifically cater to and mentor constructors from these historically excluded backgrounds. Two such publications include the Incubator and Queer Crosswords, which over the last five years have done an incredible job of mentoring a new generation of crossword constructors who are women or LGBTQ plus identified. They also offer competitive pay which makes this a, a, a sustainable option for constructors. Another institution that has begun to make this change is the New York Times itself, who's now offering what's called the Diverse Crossword Constructor Fellowship. New York Times director of games, Ever Dean Mason, said in the Times, we want our puzzles to reflect the reality of all Americans, which means we want to publish work that reflects a diverse range of cultural reference points, language usage, and communities. Constructors, <laughs> Constructors who receive this fellowship will receive mentorship from the Times editorial team themselves, as well as, again, competitive pay. In medicine, better support for diversity does include creating a health workforce that looks like the patients we're meant to serve. But it's not enough to just admit more medical students or health profession students from historically excluded backgrounds. Institutions need to look inwards they need to examine their histories of exclusion, the racism and systemic barriers that have made these students historically excluded, and they need to address them. They also need to create, as with crosswords, mentorship networks and better financial support to make a health profession's career more achievable for students who have been excluded. Doing so will create a healthcare workforce that is more diverse, which is a good in and of itself, but which is also good for patients. Because if the people serving these patients share their background and look like the population they're serving, this limiting idea of the average or normal patient is less likely to limit the care that those patients will receive. So in conclusion, I urge everyone here today to leave behind the limitations of normal, to really push the envelope. If I've made my point convincingly, the results of doing so should be 18 across, unlikely to surprise, the new normal. <laughs>